to be able to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Bonnie Ramsey. She's a professor here of pediatrics and the program director for the Core Center for Gene Therapy. She also is director of the Cystic Fibrosis Therapeutics Development Network. And it's my understanding that she really helped to build the infrastructure for this network. And they have coordinated uh, more than 60 clinical trials since she developed this in the late 1990s. They have more than 40 staff, and she really is helping to move the basic science and her creative ideas into clinical trials so that we can then move them towards helping patients. She also is very involved with our clinical research center and is the associate program director here for Children's Hospital. Her academic pedigree is outstanding. She received her medical degree from Harvard. She completed her residency in pediatrics in Boston, as well as here in Seattle. And she's board certified in both pediatrics and pulmonary medicine. For her scholarly work, she has published more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and numerous book chapters. All of them are around the theme of cystic fibrosis and respiratory care. In fact, her first publication in 1983 was about antibiotics and their bioavailability in patients with cystic fibrosis. She has really dedicated her entire academic and scholarly career to this disease. She is a leader, and not just a leader, she's an international leader in cystic fibrosis. She's an outstanding clinician and a dedicated researcher on this topic. She led studies that proved the efficacy of a very unique way of delivering an antibiotic to patients with cystic fibrosis. And I'm going to let her share with you the story of how she developed this and how it's working to help patients. Now, because of this very amazing um, invention, she was nominated and received the Inventor of the Year Award in 2009 from the University of Washington. In 2006, Maria Cantwell and Hillary Clinton presented her with the Helen S. Jackson Woman of Valor Award. In 2005, McDermott nominated her for the National Library of Medicine, Women of Distinction. She has received numerous accolades, and this is just a few. But I thought I would share one more, because it's very unique. <laughs> I know of no other physician, professor, or investigator who has received the following accolade. One of the families uh, appreciated all that she did for them, and they named a 928-ton barge. They christened it the Bonnie R. in her honor. <laughs> this is true. She has been very involved with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and in fact received their highest distinction this award, the Paul de St. Agnes Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award. And she currently directs the foundation's national network of clinical trials. Now, there is a time-honored tradition in medicine and how we teach medical school. And you all are attending mini medical school. We like to involve patients. It's very important we think about what we're doing from the patient's perspective and from the family's perspective. With that in mind, I want to close with a quote. And this is from Sir William Osler. He said, to study the phenomenon of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea, while to study books without patients is not to go to sea at all. It's very true. And with that in mind, Dr. Ramsey has actually invited a family and their son, and they're actually going to join her towards the end of her presentation. And so I'm really looking forward to this. I want to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Ramsey.
Well, I'm delighted to be here tonight, and what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, my, uh, my research in cystic fibrosis, in particular developing a new way to give antibiotics uh, directly into the lung to treat respiratory infections in patients with cystic fibrosis. So first of all, what is cystic fibrosis, or CF? It is the most common life-shortening inherited disease in the Caucasian population. There are 30,000 individuals in the United States and 60,000 that we know of in the world. It's probably much greater than that. It does occur in other uh, ethnic and racial uh, populations, but it's much less common. And it's a disease that's caused by an abnormal gene on chromosome number seven that results in an abnormal protein. Now the protein is called cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, but we just call it CFTR because that's a lot easier. Now what I'm going to talk about today, even though it's, cystic fibrosis affects many organs in the body such as the pancreas and the liver and the GI tract, it's really the lung which is the cause of most of the sickness uh, and consequences uh, within cystic fibrosis. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And what I'd like to do now is to focus down into the lung. So this is a picture of the trachea going down into the airway and into the smaller airways. And if we look even closer, if you go along the edge of the airway, there are cells there that are called lining cells. The other name for these are epithelia. And they line up like soldiers, and they have little hair-like projections called cilia on the top of them. And they sit and they move like seagrass underwater, and they move uh, mucus out of the lungs and clear the lungs. Now, the CFTR protein sits right here, right at the base of the cilia. So in this next picture, those cells that were on their side are now sitting upright. And you can see that this, these are the cilia. This is an actual um, uh, EM picture of a cilia. And this, the CFTR protein would sit right down here at the base. Now, normally, the body puts just the right amount of fluid above these cells so that the cilia can move very easily. And that's called the periciliar le level, or PCL. What happens in cystic fibrosis is that the salt moves into the cell, brings water with it, and that results in the size of the, I can't get this there. I, the size of the fluid level comes way down. When it comes down, the mucus that sits on top of it comes down as well. And it becomes very thick. If you think in your mind, mucus is sort of like spaghetti. If you have mucus in, uh, excuse me, if you have spaghetti in a vat of water, what does it do? It moves very easily. If you pour it out, the spaghetti becomes very thick, and that's the same thing that happens for mucus. So what happens in cystic fibrosis is you have the defective gene, which creates a defective protein. It alters that salt movement that results in drying of mucus, which you see here. Now, if you look into the airway itself, so if you're looking down an airway tube, it should be open, just like this one right here. But when you get thickened mucus, it becomes plugged, which you see here in the CF lung. And that's what leads to uh, infection of the airways. So what happens when your lungs are filled with mucus plugs? Well, you cough to try and clear the mucus out you are more susceptible to infections, and I'll talk about this in a minute. And then the mucus makes it much harder to breathe out. So you can breathe in air, but when you try to breathe out, it obstructs your 
uh, ability to breathe out, and that is measured in what we call your forced expiratory volume at one second, or how much you can breathe out in one second. So one of the key things we do to follow uh, patients, similar to asthma, but we do this in cystic fibrosis, is we have them do a breathing test called spirometry, where they breathe in and then breathe out as fast as they can. And what you would normally do is you take in a deep breath, and then if you don't have any airway obstruction, you can have a very linear or straight, uh, what we call expiration. If you have plugging or mucus plugging, when you try to breathe out, it's like breathing through a straw, it becomes what we call concave, like that. And so that's one of the major findings, and that's what we follow to see if a patient uh, is doing better or not. Now, I've already shown you this uh, airway, but what happens is when you have the thickened mucus, as you see here, you can get bacteria that will basically line the top of the mucus. And the mucus is very rich. It's rich in sugar, and so it's like the bacteria landing in a candy store. It's, the, it's a place they love to be. And so a bunch of white cells will come in to try and fight the infection, but they won't be successful in clearing it out. Now here is the bacteria that knows how to take advantage of the cystic fibrosis lung. It's called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or we call it PA for short, because that's a lot easier. And here's a picture of it. These are the epithelial cells. This is that purple thing is a white cell. And those little green rods are Pseudomonas. And within the first 10 years of life, patients with cystic fibrosis will often uh, get Pseudomonas in their lungs. Pseudomonas is everywhere in our environment. It loves water. So if it's in the drains of your shower, it's the drains of your sink. It's a very common bug, but it doesn't usually uh, stay in your lungs unless there's something that um, makes it uh, easier. And in CF, it's because of this obstructed mucus. Now, Pseudomonas is actually a very, very smart bug. That's why it survived for millions and millions of years. So when it first arrives in the lung, it's free-floating. It's got a little tail called a flagella, and it swims in, or if it's in a stream, it swims in. And then when it gets there, it meets up with a bunch of his buddies, and they all form a colony called a microcolony. And then they really have a very advanced society that we didn't realize for a long time. They form what are called biofilms, or my, which are almost like elaborate uh, apartment buildings where they become very organized and then they cover themselves with this sugar coating, um, which then makes them impermeable to white cells and antibiotics. So it's the biofilm production that's very important. This isn't unique to CF. We also see this like if you put a catheter in a patient, but uh, certainly is common in CF. So the last 30 years of my career, I have been interested in how can we get the pseudomonas out of the lungs of, the, of these patients, because once it gets in there, it literally stays uh, for years and years. At least we used to think that. And um, we couldn't get rid of it, and then it would cause uh, scar uh, tissue and damage in the lung. So when I started uh, my practice back in the early 1980s, and I actually did my residency training in the late 70s, uh, one of the most common uh, types of admissions you would see to a children's hospital anywhere in the United States was for cystic fibrosis. And that's because all these pseudomonas infections had to be treated with intravenous antibiotics, and it was two antibiotics. One was tobramycin, and the other was what we call a beta-lactam, which is uh, similar to the penicillin-type uh, antibiotics. And so you would, the patients would come in, and they would be in the hospital 14 to 28 days, and then you would see whether their FEV1, that, that lung function measure, would improve. 
and then we would do clapping and help clear the lungs and so forth. It was not unusual for children and adolescents to spend one-third to one-half of their lives in the hospital uh, back then. So, and the economic impact of that, even in the mid-90s, was fairly striking. The average hospital stay back then for uh, IVs was $2,000. You can figure today that would be at least twice that. Um, to, uh, about 85% of their admissions were for these infections, and if you added it up, the total cost in 1996 was about $400 million for treatment of these IV uh, treatments. So it was a huge impact to try to get these patients out, out of the hospital. In uh, the mid-1980s, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Arnold Smith, who's an infectious disease specialist, made a very, very simple but critical observation in the laboratory. Uh, usually when we decide what dose of antibiotics we use, we determine something called the MIC, or the median inhibitory concentration, and that's based on if the bacteria was in the bloodstream. But what he did is said, well, the bacteria is not in the bloodstream, it's in the airway, it's in sputum. So what happens if we put the bacteria in sputum and we add the antibiotic there? And what he found was sputum was very inhibitory of the tobramycin. So you had to get 10 times the dose to even stop the bacteria from growing. So this shows bacterial growth uh, here. And then you'd have to get to, oh, it's, okay. you'd have to get to 25 times the dose that you would give in the blood to try and get the bacteria to start coming down to kill them. Well, there's a problem with that. And, well, let me first step back and say, why was this happening? And the reason it was happening is because we were looking at patients who had established Pseudomonas infection, and they were already up to this biofilm. So once the, the Pseudomonas was in a biofilm, then it's going to require very, very high doses to try and overcome that. We're going to come back to this picture in a minute. You know, so, do you increase the dose of tobramycin 25 times uh, and give it IV? No, because what you'll do is you'll wipe out their kidneys and you'll make them deaf in the process because the, the doses are too high. So, really, the only choice you have is to try to give it the antibiotic directly into the lung where the infection is. And um, that way, if it's not absorbed into the bloodstream, then you may be able to get a high enough dose to do local killing, but not have the side effects that would happen if it got throughout the rest of the body. So we understood this in theory, and I was a clinical scientist and Arnold Smith a lab scientist, but it was much easier said than done, because there was no approved treatment of, by antibiotics given through a nebulizer. This was not a route that was well developed. People had sort of tried it, but it had never uh, been developed as a therapy. So the FDA, if you go to the FDA with something they've never seen before, they don't have any guidance for you. Um, so they don't know what the, how toxic it is. They don't understand what the animal toxicology studies are going to look like. So they basically say, try it and come back and talk to us. So we had many unanswered questions. What was the dose? What type of nebulizer were we going to use to, to get it down? How often do you give it? How many days do you give it? And it, was it going to be absorbed into the body? So what I'm going to tell you in the next about five minutes is about 10 years worth of, of studies. But um, we decided that if we were going to use a target antibiotic to try this, that we were going to use tobramycin. Now, tobramycin is what's called an aminoglycoside, and it was already the workhorse for IV antibiotics. But the reason you have to give it IV is because it's not absorbed through the intestine, so that's why you can't take it as a pill. And it's also not absorbed through the respiratory tract. Now, that was great. That's exactly what we wanted, because we wanted to be able to give huge amounts into the lung and not have it absorbed into the body 
where it could cause uh, side effects. We also knew what dose we wanted because we knew from those laboratory studies that we had to get 20 to 25 times the level that you would want in the blood. And so we guessed that to be somewhere between 300 and 400 micrograms per gram of sputum. And we could measure that in the sputum. We also liked tobramycin because it has sustained killing. So once you get a whole bunch of it in there, it'll hang around for a while and have a sustained effect. And we knew what we were looking for as far as toxicity because this has been used for you know, years and years and years. So here shows you what the drug development process looks like. There are many, many steps. And usually you start with animal toxicity studies. Um, and those had been done for the IV preparation, but not for inhalation. But since we were uh, just trying to understand whether this worked or not, uh, we started with what are called the phase one and phase two studies. So right here, you do early testing to figure out what dose you need, how often you need to give it, and what we call a proof of concept. Can this work or can't it? And then you go to um, phase three or the, what we call pivotal trial or the final trial to prove to the FDA that it works. So let me just take you through some highlights of what we did. So in the late 80s and early 90s, we did a study in about 71 uh, patients at about six sites around the United States that was published in the New England Journal in 1993. And there we looked to see whether the tobramycin was able to kill the bacteria in the lung, in the sputum, and whether it improved that lung function measure, FEV1. Well, we were ecstatic because it killed over 95% of bacteria. Now, you have to understand, in sputum, there's 100 million bacteria per cubic centimeter, about the size of a, a sugar cube. So by killing 95%, we got it down to about a million. So we didn't kill it all, but that was a huge amount of killing. And we improved the lung function about 15%. So that was great. We showed that we could do it, but the problem was we had used this nebulizer called an ultrasonic nebulizer that was totally impractical. It was this mammoth thing. You couldn't take it anywhere. It blew steam all over the world. And this is the new one, but let me tell you, it was about 10 times the size of that. So we had to go back, and we had to get a much smaller, what we call a jet nebulizer, which is what you see here. Um, then we had to develop the the mist treatment that we were giving so that it wouldn't be irritating to the lungs. We had to get the right pH, the right osmolarity. Uh, we had to um, make sure that we had the right particle size so that it would go into the lung and not be coughed right back out again. So we were finally successful at doing that, but then we needed to get an uh, industry partner that really could do the national study and deliver it to the FDA. So we partnered, the UW and Children's partnered with a biotech company here in Seattle called Pathogenesis, which has subsequently been bought out by Novartis. And um, so the company did the animal tox studies that had to be done for the FDA. They did the final uh, drug formulation, um, put together the FDA package, and together we, we designed the big phase three study. And so in that study, we had to show that this improved lung function, FEV1, decreased bacterial density and decreased hospitalization. So what you see here again is in the big study, and this was uh, about 750 patients uh, in over 60 sites around the country, we showed that we could again have about two log killing, which is 90% killing of bacteria, so we, they were on the drug, then they would go off for a month and it would come back up again, then they'd go on, off. We don't know why in the third month we didn't have as much treatment effect, but then we never looked at it again after that, so I'll never be able to answer that question. But then we looked at the FEV1, and again, we got about a 12% improvement off, on, off, on. So you can see we did alternate month, and each time they would get improvement in FEV1. And so we, the first six months, there was placebo, and you can see the placebo group did not show any improvement. Then they got it, and they showed a jump up. And then out at almost two years, 
they were still 5% over where they started, which was uh, actually fairly dramatic. So based on that, uh, the FDA was impressed and uh, the drug was uh, approved uh, in um, 1999. And since then, over the last uh, almost 12 years, 11 years, uh, Tobermycin has now been used uh, uh, worldwide. This is a picture from the National Cystic Fibrosis Re Registry where they ask uh, all the sites, how many of your patients are taking Toby? And you can see in 2008 that each of these uh, vertical lines is a different center. So there's 120 centers across the country and each one represents a center. So the usage ranges from 100% in some centers down to roughly 20%. But the average is about two-thirds, 67.7%. So two-thirds of patients in the United States, which would be 20,000 uh, individuals, uh, are receiving TOBI. Now, this was very, very exciting, but this wasn't enough for us. And the reason it wasn't enough was twofold. First of all, where we were treating this infection was where it was already very well established. So right up here where you already had biofilm formation. So they already had formed colonies, they already had this sugar coating, and they were already quite resistant to antibiotics. And that's where you really needed to get uh, 25 times the concentration that you would be able to get in the blood. But we know from, uh, from laboratory research that these bacteria start out uh, free swimming and free floating. And these bacteria, the very first ones that get into the lungs, are actually very sensitive to the antibiotic. And part of the problem was, is this was occurring in very young children. And so we started doing studies where we would actually look in, down into the lung in the younger children, and we saw, yes, they do have these earlier pseudomonas. So we thought, maybe we're starting way too late when we treat these patients. We need to move back and start treating them the very first time we see it. Because, to be honest with you, back in the 80s, when we would first see the pseudomonas, we'd say, oh, well, it's there, it's there, we'll just ignore it, until it became an established infection. Why? Because you knew when it was established they'd have to be in the hospital all the time, so you didn't want to start treating them. So our whole mindset changed. And we started thinking that we had a window of opportunity for early intervention in the younger children when they first got colonized. And so we started a series of studies where we would do a bronchoscopy, see if we found the pseudomonas early on, and then give the TOBI. And we, all, we also had to check and see, well, when you give it to a little kid, do you give the same dose that you give to an adult? It turns out you do. All ages, whether you're six months old or 35, you get the same dose because the amount you can breathe in, it varies, and so that corrects for the difference uh, in the dosage. It's actually one, one uh, size fits all. So what we did is we proposed to do this study with about 120 children, where half would get placebo, which is uh, salt water, and the other half would get Toby. We did a bronchoscopy, gave them the treatment, and then did a follow-up bronchoscopy. Now, bronchoscopy is you take a tube, you go down the lungs, and you collect the sample down there to, to see what bacteria is there. So we started out, and um, when we had only gotten about, Sharon, was it 25 patients? It was really a very small number of the patients we had our data safety monitoring board look at the data, and they stopped the study with only 25 patients. I, of course, was in a panic. I didn't know why they'd stop the study. Um, and it turned out because of the data that's right here. So the patients who got the TOBI are here. So they started out with 10 to the 8. So 10 to the 6th is a million bugs per sugar cube size, up to 10 to the 8th, again, is about 10 million. Or, and then, at the end, all eight of the patients who received the TOBI 
had completely removed all Pseudomonas from their lung. So I'm not saying they just knocked it down. We had eliminated it. We didn't think that was possible. So this was a totally different approach that we would eliminate it from the lungs. Whereas in the placebo group over here, one, group, one patient went down spontaneously. All the rest basically didn't change at all. So the, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, which is this group that, independent group that reviews your data, said, you have to stop the study. You can't continue to give placebo to half of the children. So at that point, we said, well, we need to better understand giving Toby to young children. So we went back to the NIH and we started this five-year study called Early Pseudomonas Infection Control, or EPIC, uh, which we just finished uh, this last year and the data just came out actually a couple months ago. And in this study, we said, well, we have to treat everybody, uh, uh, at least initially with Toby. We can't, because of the results of the previous study, um, it was decided that we couldn't have a, a placebo group. But we decided that we would have four different approaches, because we really didn't know what was the best. So one approach was to give uh, inhaled tobramycin, which is Toby, um, and uh, with just a placebo oral antibiotic. And that, in that group, you would get treated only if you had a positive culture. So we kept looking for cultures. At this, now we're just doing cultures in the upper airway. We're not going down the lower lung because that's a much more invasive um, procedure. So we were repeatedly culturing the children. If they turned positive, then we would treat them. Um, then we had one group where if they were positive, we would treat them with Toby plus an oral antibiotic called ciprofloxacin. And then we had another group where we would automatically treat them every three months for 18 months, whether they were positive or not. Uh, to see whether that was a better preventative therapy. So there, the, there's tons of data, but I'm just going to give you the bottom line data here. And that is when we gave a, so patients had to have a positive culture to come in. Many of them got one round of treatment um, initially, and that dropped the positive rate from 100% down to 40%. We then gave everybody a, sta a, a treatment, another treatment of Toby, and that dropped the positive rate down to uh, about 15 percent. And after that, um, the two groups divided up between whether you were treated because you had a positive culture or whether you were just treated automatically. And we found that after that, if you look all the way across here, it really didn't make any difference. Uh, you could just treat them. Most of these patients only needed to be treated once. And for 18 months, about 15% of them uh, remained positive, but 85% of them were negative. Uh, we're now following these patients out for yet another uh, five to 10 years. But uh, we, you know, we wish this were 100%, so we still have this 10 to 15% we have to figure out what to do with. But to think, when we started with Toby, we didn't eliminate Pseudomonas from anybody. We just dropped down the amount. And now we've come to a point where we're getting about 85% clearance. And um, it's lasting, we know at this point, out to uh, 18 months. So um, what we have found over the last 20 years is that in reality, Pseudomonas infections, and I think if you talk to anybody who treated cystic fibrosis in the 80s or 90s, you would have been told you can't cure a, a pseudomonas infection in CF, but we can treat it. Um, we have to get in there before that biofilm forms when they have the early pseudomonas that is still swimming around freely, and then we can eliminate over 80% of it fairly easily uh, without any IV therapy. And we know now that treatment of the pseudomonas infection has a very, very positive impact on lung function. And the other thing that we've discovered, so if you look here, back in the 80s, when I started, 
children with cystic fibrosis um, lived into their teens. Now, um, they're living well into adulthood. And children now with cystic fibrosis, we expect to live uh, well into old age. Uh, it has been a very, very dramatic effect uh, over the past um, 20 years. So to put it mildly, that's, that's been extraordinarily rewarding for me. So with that, what I would like to do um, is to open up for questions, but I don't want the questions just to be for me. I am going to introduce you to a family. Um, I don't know if you would like to come up here. So, it, and uh, also uh, the research nurse who worked on my study. So here we have the, the Gray family. We have Michael and Susan and Elliot. And Elliot um, is in the third grade. And Elliot participated in the EPIC trial. Um, and Sharon McNamara, as I said, is, was a uh, research coordinator. So what Elliot's going to show you is how he takes uh, the inhaled tobramycin. I'll be very honest. Uh, it doesn't actually have tobramycin in it, but um, it all looks the same. But um, so he will um, do the treatment. And then what I'm going to do is just uh, Ask the parents, do, do they have microphones there? Ask them to give you a little bit of their insights, and then we'll just open it up for people to ask any questions they want to. So uh, I, don't, I don't know, Susan or Michael, if one of you wants to just sort of talk about the um, treatments, um, regimens that you have to uh, give Elliot every day and so forth, I want you want to take that. Sure. Um, you know, well, Elliot is, right now he's going to take this stuff called Pulmazyme. And it's, oh, and he's, he's doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> so this helps, uh, the Pulmazyme, I, I, actually the, uh, what it does, I think Bonnie could probably explain better than I could. But um, this is something that he, he, he breathes every day. And he just does it once, and the, the Toby was uh, twice, twice. A, twice a day. And uh, this just really basically keep, uh, helps prevent white cell uh, buildup. Yeah. And uh, it's, he's very, as you can see, he's uh, very compliant. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a good day, but he, he, always, <laughs> he, always does his, uh, he always does his breathing very well. And he's, you know, he's never, he, he doesn't really grouse too much about it. So he's, he's pretty good. So, Elliot, have you ever been in the hospital? I mean, you know you have to come and visit me, but... <laughs> have you ever been in the hospital? Overnight. Overnight. When my mom was a baby, she <laughs> gave birth to me, and I had this thing called cystic fibrosis, and I had to stay overnight, so they cut my stomach open to get some, what is it, it's a plug, it was a plug in my stomach to get it open, and I take these things called pills, so I, so, and subs. Oh. <laughs> So, I was actually well into adulthood uh, when I had Elliot, <laughs> middle age even, and, um, and when he was born, uh, he was diagnosed right away uh, with cystic fibrosis. He had an impacted bowel at birth caused by his pancreas not functioning. Dr. Ramsey described that um, there are many other organs that cystic fibrosis impacts. The pancreas is um, probably about 80% of the time one of those organs. And Elliot's pancreas um, doesn't emit uh, the enzymes that a regularly normal functioning pancreas um, emits. So he has a really hard time absorbing fat and protein. And that created a blockage in his stomach. And I think he'd like to tell you more about it. And when I don't take my enzymes, or what I call pills, I can get a bad stomach ache, which um, 
leads to gas. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and sometimes when I don't take the beads, uh, I don't know. Well, luckily, he takes his beads most of the time, so. And he's, yeah, he, he, we, he doesn't ever usually miss those, so he's, he's pretty good with those. So let me just loop back to what Dr. Ramsey asked us initially in terms of treatment. Um, every time Elliot eats, he takes, um, orally, he takes pancreatic enzymes, and those help him absorb his nutrients from his food. Um, and they last about an hour and a half, and so he takes them with every meal and with snacks. And when they told me, as I was trying to breastfeed him as an infant, that I needed to just simply give these to your newborn, I, I thought they were pretty much crazy. But um, we got over that one. <laughs> and uh, right now, those are really uh, the treatments that we do on a daily basis. Um, in addition, Elliot gets as much aerobic exercise is possibly human, and, and he loves it. So, do you want to add something? Yeah. And when I don't take my beads, I can't absorb as, mu absorb as much calories as I need to because I'm kind of a little bit underweight, so I need some more calories than usual, and if I don't take my pills, I won't be able to get as much calories as usual people, usual people get when they eat. So um, one uh, very uh, exciting thing is that since the study, um, knock on wind, Elliot has not had Pseudomonas again, so he's not, that's the reason he doesn't have Toby right now is because he hasn't had to take it again. So um, what he, they've talked to you about is many of the digestive problems of cystic fibrosis. But fortunately, unless my memory's really bad, I don't think he's ever had to be in for lung reasons, which is what most kids with CF used to have to come in for. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you have something else to say? <laughs> so, I have a question. Yeah. So, my question, Elliot, was what do you do at home when you're doing your nebulizing treatments to make them go faster? And, you know, is it ever hard for you to do them? And I think we're going to have to switch microphones because that one I didn't turn on. <laughs> So what, what do you do? Um, usually I watch uh, TV and <laughs> universal sports going to the Olympics. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's the big ski channel. <laughs> and skiing and snowboarding and luging and skeletoning. Yeah. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Well, I was just curious, you mentioned that other centers, some used the Toby and some didn't. Did they all now use the, your new treatment protocol? It really shouldn't have been 100. I'm not quite sure why some of the centers would have been 100%, because you really shouldn't be on Toby unless you have Pseudomonas. And um, there is a certain percentage of the population that doesn't have Pseudomonas. But yeah, it has become pretty standardized now. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some centers that tend to adopt things more quickly than others, but it is, uh, it's fairly standardized. And actually, uh, CF care is very standard, standardized across the world now, so. <clears throat> I got two questions. So during the Toby treatment, um, are there, is there a, a, a control environment necessary for the patients? And second question is, what are the chances of uh, reinfection with pseudomonas oh. post-Toby treatment? Oh, that's a great question. So the first question was about a controlled environment. So um, we, no, they don't have to be inside. I'm sure your concern is the fact that in the mist there is uh, uh, tobermycin coming out. Fortunately, tobermycin um, doesn't cause a lot of allergic reactions. I would be more concerned if you were giving a penicillin-like drug because there are lots of people in the community that can be penicillin allergic. But tobramycin has an extraordinarily low rate of that. So we really have not had problems uh, with that. We do, you know, they're at home. We encourage them to be alone. You know, they wouldn't be doing it in the middle of a classroom. So in that sense, 
Um, you know, you, and if you're in the hospital, you would do it in, your pri in a private room. Uh, so, but it's not like, um, you know, some of the treatments for RSV where they have to be in a special isolation tent. The second question is, yes, you can uh, get to reemergence of pseudomonas. We have to, every time the patients come in, we culture them. And if it gets positive, then we have to treat them again. So there's just constant vigilance uh, for pseudomonas. So every three months, um, we have to get a throat swab. Right, Elliot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering about the... Um you mentioned that, that this is pretty widespread, uh, in, in widespread use now. And I'm wondering if you've gotten, had enough time to get data back from the various centers to see if there's any kind of variation in the, uh, in the um, in outcomes of the patients in the various centers, or is it pretty, pretty uh, uniform across the board? Um, so that's, that's a little bit hard to judge um, because um, um, you know, there's not ongoing trials, so the only thing that we can look at is, huh? Oh, you're talking about for the little kids, or are you yes, talking sir. about for the adults? Oh, for, yeah, I was, I was talking For the about little that. kids, uh, for the little kids study, the EPIC study, we have an ongoing trial uh, that's going on for at least another five years and maybe another ten years where we're actually tracking all of those kids so that, I mean, so like Elliot's still in this uh, EPIC observational trial. So we'll be able to track them. There is this national data registry that every child and adult with CF in the United States is on this registry. And so all their lung functions, all their microbiology is, is tracked. Uh, so it's, it's really a pretty powerful tool. And is it tracked against the treatments that are given as well? Yeah, so really? that's part of the reason that we could do that is to record what treatments they're on. And um, so... But, you know, right now, of course, Tobri has penetrated much of the, of the population, so there isn't a big group that's not on it. But, yeah, we are tracking it. Thank you. And one of the big questions is, is, the, is there resistance developing? And actually, initially, there was a little bit of resistance, but it really leveled off that we thought that would be a big problem, and it, and it really hasn't been, so we've been pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Yeah, can you? If I remember right, this is a single gene disease, isn't it? Yes, it's a single and, and gene. And I guess it's recessive. Yes, it is recessive. Uh, the parents have recessive defect? Yeah, so they're, they're carriers. Yes, it's a recessive. They are, and their relatives have some problem in no. the past. No? Carriers don't have any. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I actually have two questions. Uh, what symptoms are evident shortly after birth that a child has cystic fibrosis? Okay, well, just to let you know, now in the state of Washington, partly because of the efforts of Michael Gray over here, um, there is a universal newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. So if a, actually it's nationwide. As of 2009, every state in the United States screens newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. Um, so if you don't get picked up through screening, um, the symptoms would be uh, like Elliot where, uh, well he had a bowel obstruction, but you won't be able to digest food so you can't gain weight, um, and then you get respiratory infections. So those are the most common symptoms. Okay. My second question is, I've heard of something called the best airway clearance system. Yeah. Is that widely used or? Yes. Um, it's a automatic uh, percussor sy sy uh, system, and it's used, um, I don't know, maybe 40% of our patients. Okay. It's not mandatory, but a lot of patients like it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I think, I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, one more question, I didn't see you. This is for Elliot. How many of your pills do you have to take for each meal? If it's a big meal, four. If it's pretty big, dinner. Four. Four. Okay. You want to tell them what what sports you play, Elliot? Um, baseball, soccer, uh, football, basketball. <laughs> um, what else is there? <laughs> 
tennis, tennis. and... Elliot's a very good athlete. He's very modest, but he's actually a very good athlete. So. So, and running. And running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming. <laughs>